again, once again, Josh mm-hmm. continues to be the doody daddy in this series, and and I'm is that like <laughs> just like is that like a sugar daddy. daddy, but like the opposite, like oh, yeah. do you want to be my doody daddy? <laughs> I hated that. I hate it. <laughs> Do you want to play a game? What's your favorite scary movie? Be afraid. Be very afraid. See that. You're gonna need a bigger boat. Here's Johnny. The power of Christ compels you. The power of Christ compels you. Whatever you do, don't fall asleep. Welcome to Talking Horror with Jamie and Nikisha. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jamie. And I'm Nikisha, and this is Talking Horror with Jamie and Nikisha. Where we share our love, 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 love for all things spooky dooky ooky and Ooh. talk horror through the lens of human behavior. Welcome, everyone. Hello. <laughs> so today is going to be a doozy of a day because we are talking about the 2023 supernatural horror film insidious the red door i think you have to say it that way every time every time <laughs> we have to slam the a door, door. <laughs> or no it's the the tiptoe through the window oh. or whatever I have a <laughs> uh great so we are going to talk about everything insidious we will probably also talk about some of the previous movies so just be prepared for that as well but insidious the red door was directed by patrick wilson our favorite scream king in his Mm -hmm. directorial debut and it is based off of a story by the one lee winnell and scott team uh scott teams And this is a direct sequel to the Insidious Chapter 2, and it is the fifth installment in the Insidious chain. Fifth installment. So it also stars Patrick Wilson, Rose Byrne, Ty Simpkins, Andrew Astor, Steve Coulter, Winnell himself, Angus Sampson, and Lynn Shea reprising all of their roles from the previous film, which I think is very cool because... I don't think I realized that all of the younger kids, the Daltons and the, what was the other kid's name? Foster? Of it all, the Daltons, is like- the forgotten child, and the baby. <laughs> <laughs> not forgotten anymore because now they're older and living They're back, the baby. Show. And they are not babies. <laughs> they are not. <laughs> they are adults. So, uh, and I don't think, I was trying to think of any other movies that might have done that. And I don't think that there's a lot, probably because usually when a sequel or something comes out and they flash forward a couple of years, like the younger person hasn't gotten to that age yeah, yet. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely more of a now thing because we're getting all these legacy sequels. Mm. You yes. know what I mean? Like, Absolutely. But like a lot of times, like the kids were just like the age that they were in the sequel. But now they're getting right. these legacy sequels and a lot of these actors are still actors you know like like ty simpkins and stuff like that where they're able to kind of like get them back in the game yeah back (laughs) in the game ready to go yes so uh (laughs) obviously heavy spoilers for all of this and some of the other insidious movies so if you have not seen this it is in theaters press pause Go to your local Alamo draft house like I did and watch this movie with a nice milkshake in your hand and then come back and listen. There's nothing better than a boozy milkshake. Nothing better. Oh, it's so good. A thousand percent. It is truly God's gift to the earth besides Beyonce, which we will also (laughs) probably talk about later. (laughs) Beyonce and Boozy milkshakes for the win. Mm-hmm. Uh, grand. So, Jamie, give us those trigger warnings <laughs> for this movie. Yes, we are back in the further. So, that means more ghosts and demons. Mm. Um, <laughs> and so, if those themes make you uncomfortable, this might not be for you. There is also um, some ghostly vomit, ghoulish, ghoulish vomiting, a uh, frat, frat culture. Uh, a man wearing a diaper, um, excessive drinking. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like that's... And we got another, again, I'm going to say it. 
another PG thirteen installment in this chain. So yes, it's, sure. It's it's there's not like a oh there. I mean, there is also reference to suicide and um and mm. being institutionalized mm-hmm. um and like other like psychosis and schizophrenia and other mental health um but i feel like yeah again it's you don't see a lot of the spookish spookish things spookish i don't really know spookish. what we're like making it. up there spookish, spookish. I love um it. not a lot of the spookish directly on the screen or like it's minimal yeah grand well brian producer brian can you give us some words so that we can get into open the door to the red door open the door yeah hey. we can uh, <laughs> that was really good Um, good. uh yeah hey everybody (laughs) producer brian here um you can find us wherever you get podcasts what you're doing right now but you can also see us on youtube hi everybody oh hey what up what up we're on youtube you can see us there um but also we are on all the social media apps uh including threads now we're on threads We're here. We have a Threads, y'all. We have a Threads. <laughs> we're on, we're on uh, Threads, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Talk wow. Horror Pod on all of them. And we Woo-hoo. finally, thanks to your help, hit 15k followers on TikTok. We, we did, did it. it. The thank next, you. the next. Thank you so much. The next goal thank is you. 20k. Um, we've got some really fun stuff there. I'm thinking of putting a lot of the TikToks onto. Um, uh shorts oh uh, shorts on uh, yeah. our youtube salute your channel shorts. salute your shorts camp and then <laughs> we um, do in our hearts, in our hearts. <laughs> and when we think about you this thing it makes me wanna heart. fart um yes um wow we all just showed our millennial ages yeah. <laughs> i was gonna say uh, tell me you're from the 90s born in yeah, the 90s. yeah i know right <laughs> yeah. um uh but that was super so yeah so um thanks for that and uh yeah, that's cool. Back to you, Nikisha. <laughs> Fantastic. I just, again, am obsessed with the fact that we just sang Salute Your Shorts. But... Oh, do you want to hear a fun 90s millennial story quickly? <laughs> yes. So we had some friends come over this weekend. Uh, uh, I told them I'd give them shout outs. Shout out to Zoe and shout out to Charlie. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> Zoe told us that she really liked the Wednesday TV show. I think she's uh, she's um, she's six. Um, and she really enjoyed the uh, the TV show. Um, and so Jamie and I were like, oh, you know what you would really like? So while we were barbecuing, we turned on The Addams Family from 1991, and oh. she loved it. And so yes. then we turned on Addams Family Values. Values, yes. And she enjoyed that as well. So we were very proud to, uh, to uh, introduce those versions of the Adams family to this uh, this budding horror fan, if you will. <laughs> oh, I love that. She will be obsessed now. I'm sure her Halloween costume will be Wednesday Adams and it'll be uh, yeah. perfection. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well. <laughs> that was exciting. That was exciting. It really is nice when you introduce younger people to some things that were near and dear to your hearts, which makes me feel so old just saying that out loud. <laughs> but it really is just like, yeah, this is really good stuff. It's not just my nostalgia, right? It's like, mm-hmm. no, this is... Those this movies are still through. good. Oh, yes. those movies are, are still very good. Yeah, absolutely. Great. And you can see my ratings on Letterboxd, <laughs> BP527. Oh, boy. <laughs> Obsessed. <laughs> Amazing. Well, did y'all watch anything new uh, this week? Uh, yeah, we did. Jamie, do you want to tell about the movie we finally watched and really enjoyed? Oh, Yes. Uh, when was it? Saturday? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Or Sunday? Saturday. We watched... Well, I don't know what day it is. Uh, and I don't know when you're all listening to this. So Fair. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> On a day recently, we watched The Last Shift. Oh. Which is... It's been like out for... I don't even know when it came out. Mm-hmm. Um, but I used to see it all the time on Netflix. And I just like didn't think about it at all but then recently um there is a sequel that i think is essentially like a remake of it called malum that came out this year and it's it's essentially like the same like a reboot or reimagining of the story oh i think the original was 2014 yeah the original Um, is last year from 2014 and the same director made malum it's essentially a remake of like 
Yeah, it's crazy. The original story. Yeah. Um, but it was really good and like okay. had yeah. some very, very effective scares. I got jump scared like several times. Nice. Um, it, it was, really it got was like me. a pretty good uh, story. I, yeah. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I would also add that not only is it jump scares, but it's just an eerie, spooky story in general. And mm -hmm. it has like long stretches of tension. So yeah. it, it's not mm -hmm. just like for those of you who like, don't just like jump scare fests it really has everything it's quite impressive um it's we had a great time i would highly suggest it mm -hmm. nice what did y'all watch it on i think it was on prime i, I think we watched remember. it on amazon prime okay i'll have to look into it then put it on my list yeah along with was... sinister <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah well we're gonna Definitely do sinister for the podcast for sure yes. um <laughs> Um, but yeah, it was really good. And then nice. we, if I check my letterbox, BP527, uh, <laughs> oh, we've just been watching all the Mission Impossible movies still. We finished them, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, cool. Love movies. that. Wait, did you finish all the Insidious movies, though, before we did this? Or you were only going to watch no. just the first two? We only well, watched I... the first two. Yeah. Okay. Not that we, like, weren't trying to watch the other ones. There's just, there's just so much stuff. Yeah. So much TV, so many movies. It's mm -hmm. it's quite wild. Yes. N I, Nikisha, what did you do? I would love to tell you what <laughs> I just did, Brian. So this is not spooky dooky at all, but I don't care because she is the queen and deserves to be spoken about in every form, facet possible. I went to go see a Miss Beyonce Giselle Knows Carter in Toronto. <laughs> Exactly. That's that is the experience that I had. Like talking about talk about like melt your face off just with the gorgeous tones and mm. the production value and the dancing and the mashups of all of her song. I mean, her discography is pretty insane now. Mm -hmm. Like all sure. the albums that she has and sh to fit it all into like a basically three hour long concert. I wanted it to go on for like another two hours, but uh, <laughs> the best part was that I just went by myself and this is a uh, pitch for solo traveling because it can be really fun to just meet new people along the way. I just wanted to go see her in Toronto because I knew it wouldn't be so crazy going up there and I'd been to Toronto before so I felt safe going up there again by myself and I sat with some other people who also got solo tickets and so we were all just having a good time in our VIP section which was really <laughs> nice. Um, we had our own like Porta potties. We didn't have to wait in line because we had. Oh, ones in you didn't mention oh. that. Yes, yes. You should have led with that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's the little things to be yeah. in a, a stadium full of people, and we had our own section of porta potties that only VIP had access to. We also had our own bar and two bartenders, and we had free drink tickets. Like this what? was an what? experience. Was this yes. at was this was this at the baseball stadium, the Rogers Center or whatever? Yeah, the Rogers Center. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Literally our section wow. was like right behind the pitcher's mounds. They had oh. to like kind of try to cover it up. <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's funny. That's you funny. Couldn't put anything on top of it. So we were like right behind it. But it was I was right in the center on the floor and like saw all of the things. <laughs> Beyonce flying in the air, you know, <laughs> she has her um her little horse that's called Renee, that the internet has called Renee. <laughs> <laughs> Renaissance. Renee. -ne. That's funny. Oh, and, sure. That's uh, funny. That's very funny. Floating in the air. But Brian, sorry to disappoint you. Blue Ivy was not there. She did oh, not. Oh, that was no. Jamie. That was, that was Jamie. Oh, Jamie. Okay, yeah. okay. Sorry. Yes. I've been like seeing her all over TikTok. So I was very excited for you. Oh, what a maybe she's, <laughs> maybe she's like, I'm not doing this right I'm now. I'm tired, mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll do, I'll do two of the eight shows. I'm not doing yeah. this one. Oh, that's but, great. I... Yeah, no, it was a great experience. If you are a fan mm. of Beyonce, even just a little bit, this is absolutely worth going to see her live. You will have the best time. So, Are you are you a crier? Did you cry during the concert? I thought I was going to cry, but I didn't. Mm. And I was very surprised at myself that I didn't Impressive. cry because I – I love her so much. She literally is, and I'm not exaggerating or being like hyperbolic. Like she is the reason why I do musical theater or like sing in mm, general sure. because Destiny's Child was my absolute favorite 
uh, group of all time. So literally, like, she is my idol. And it was, and this yeah. is my first time seeing her live. In oh, life. okay. Yes. So I, that's what. That's why I was surprised I didn't cry because this is the first time I saw her live. But are you but, crying? Yeah. Oh, I'm a cancer. Of course, I cried everything. Oh, sure, 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 sure. I'm so sorry. I'm so <laughs> sorry. Woo, woo, cancers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god, I cry. I I cry at concerts. I cry at shows. I cry when they start, mm. especially like in like the when people were able to like return to Broadway. I mm-hmm. cry that like every show that we saw for like. I think I'm still doing it because I'm like, I'm just so happy people are working again. Like, I just like, I can't control my emotions. I'm, yeah, I need to start bringing tissues. (laughs) I believe that. I feel like I've now kind of almost cried out all of my tears being uh, Eliza because literally it's just like crying all the time. And it's just like, yeah, yeah. So tired of crying. Yeah. My body's like, please stop. It's okay. Mm-hmm. You're fine. You're not in danger. Like, <laughs> no. And we'll talk about that in this too, using your trauma True. and all that stuff to yeah. arts and things and perform <clears throat> and such. But that's a nice segue. Let's get back into everything that is Insidious because I know not everybody's a Beyonce fan, but just had to tell you. Thank you for asking, Brian. It was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Loved it. Uh, grand. So. Let's get into Insidious. We need a plot summary. I have Beyonce on the brain. I honestly cannot even um, begin to try I'll, to tell you this. I'm ha- Jamie did the last one. I'll do this one. Thank you. Woohoo! What's the plot? <laughs> I'm, just gonna sing, the I'm just going to sing tiptoe to, the, tiptoe to the Tulips for two minutes. I can't Absolutely. say it. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, 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 right. Tiptoe through the Tulips. <laughs> <laughs> That's the actor tongue twister, the warm up yeah. right there. Yeah, right. <clears throat> that one was where did we see that rupaul's drag, oh, RuPaul's race. drag race yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he did that you need yeah well one York. of them uh, one of them who was on it uh has a bfa uh the one, okay a lot the, of queens have their bfas yeah uh the one that, that i usually sense. do is uh when i was when i was an actor I would do red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather, <laughs> and then you keep going up like the uh, like the scale and stuff like that. Anyway, let's do the plot. Yes, love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're doing the plot. So that means, Mister Brian, uh, you have two minutes. There are two minutes on the clock for you to tell us the entire plot summary of Insidious: colon, The Red Door. Are you ready? I am and go okay so this is nine years after the lambert family or basically erased um josh and uh what's the kid's name uh dalton Dalton. josh and dalton's memories about you know their power basically their power to um astral project themselves into uh, another realm essentially um the both of them do not remember this um it's nine years later and we find that the family has fallen apart a little bit josh and renee are separated and divorced um and he does not have a good relationship with his kids or his family in general um his mom the woman uh who was played by Barbara Hershey in the first two has passed away. And um, and Dalton is now going off to college. He drives Dalton to college. They have this big blowout fight. But uh, we learn that Patrick Wilson's character is very foggy. He just like can't seem to focus. Something seems very wrong with him. And he's going to try and figure that out. Dalton is going to um, art school. Finally, a kid who draws creepy stuff actually becomes an artist. And he goes to art school, and during art school, he's you know told to pull from his traumas, pull from his life to draw something, and he is all of a sudden like experiencing the further again because he's kind of figuring that out. Um, all the while, Patrick Wilson's character is trying to figure out what's wrong with him, and he finds out that his father actually had uh, this the astral projection um he was committed to an asylum um and ended up killing himself because he just wanted it to stop because he wanted it to stop for him for his son he was ending the line there um dalton finds out that he can astral project with his good friend chris who is the mvp of this film um and chris and him end up figuring it out but he gets trapped in the further and patrick wilson has to go back in after finding out that his memory was wiped from his wife he saves them and he saves the day the end Good job. 
And that's the plot. <laughs> right but on that's, time. Yeah. That's more or less what happened. Yeah. It's a hard it's a hard thing to kind of summarize. Well, cuz we'll get into this, but the movie is like slowly building to something and then it happens very quickly and then it was over. Mhm. You know. I like, agree a thousand and one percent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But um but let's 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 pass it to you, Nikisha. Let's dive yeah. in. Yeah. Let us let us dive into the door Ooh. with our first segment of likes and gripes. And now our likes and gripes. And actually, I will go ahead and and start just to piggyback off of what you said, Brian, because that was one of my biggest gripes. But we'll get there. I agree with you, Brian. The friend Chris MVP loved her one uh, liners, especially the one when um, she was asking about him astral projecting and what it felt like. Or and and he's like, no, it's not like a ghost. And she was like, you'll never be a ghost with that attitude, Casper. Great line. <laughs> uh, her name is Sinclair Daniel. Huge shout out to Sinclair Daniel. Yes, wonderful She's performance. Wonderful performance. <laughs> loved her. Also. It was a weird kind of 90s theme with these kids and how they dress. Did you guys notice that? Because when Dalton mm. goes to school, he literally looked like he was out of a 90s sitcom or like later Safe by the Bell because he had um, <laughs> like the flannel wraparound and the cutoff at the His whole vibe, teens. I was just like, what's happening? <laughs> yeah, but then his friend Chris too, she had on like this TLC t-shirt and I was like, okay. Oh, that's these, like, true. 90s vibe and i guess that's like the thing now like people in college are grasping towards like 90s looks as their retro whatever whatever's Mm -hmm. um but i just thought that was just very interesting and i liked it because of the 90s nostalgia sure um the shots in this i thought were great i there was a lot of really good jump scares in this that i enjoyed i loved particularly the shot in the car patrick wilson is in the car and there's the person walking towards Mm. it uh behind him and at first it kind of looks very blurry or like it might be trees or something kind of blowing behind and then it gradually gets closer and i just thought that how they shot that was um really great a lot of um the jump scares too there was a lot of tension building and quietness that was happening and Mm. where you thought things were going to come out at they didn't happen it's in I say that with the MRI um, Ooh, yeah. thing too, that one because got me good. like truly the the shot of first seeing the hand coming on his shoulder mm-hmm. and then him like feeling a presence. And so he's going to look, you know, try to look behind him. And so then it switches to first person, like point of view. So like you're seeing him look behind and then there's nothing there. And you're thinking like, that's when the jump scare is going to happen, you know, cause mm. we've already, it's already been set up with the hand coming in the shoulder. So the minute he looks, it's going to be there and it's not, and so then there's a moment of just quietness and then it's like coming up by his feet. And I'm like, this oh. is great. Yeah. Love it, love it, love it. Ugh. Love shots like that. I thought as far as Patrick Wilson's directing, I think all of his jump scares that he directed were fantastic. That's just my my huge uh, like uh, mm-hmm. across the board for this movie. I liked that more than the actual story. <laughs> so I was like, give me more jump scares and then we can mm-hmm. bypass whatever's happening in this. Another quote that I really enjoyed from uh, Chris when he was talking about he was in a coma from meningitis and she was like, I could have used a little meningitis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, I have a question because I, it's been a minute since I watched the second movie. So oh, I was going to ask because I knew we watched yes. the first one together <clears throat> and I didn't remember if you had rewatched the second one, but this one almost has more to do with the second one than the first one. It mm-hmm. does. And so then my brain was trying to think, like, of course, there's a lot of shots happening from that second movie, which was really nice to just kind of meld those two together. But in the second movie, they really did, like, erase his memory, like, with the hypnosis yes. guy. That was yeah. the thing? Okay. Yeah, so at the very right. end. Yeah, okay. at the very end. The guy who comes up to Patrick Wilson's character yes. after the funeral is the one who was in the, the second one. Um, Got who like accompanies them. He was also there when Patrick Wilson's character was a kid, when Josh was a kid and first experiencing mm. all of that. He was the one that accompanied Lynn Shay and they realized what was happening. And he's also the one who, I think, he's also the one yeah. who helped Josh forget the first time when he was Got a it. kid. So like okay. he's always been there mm-hmm. to do this 
to forget memory it. to uh, mm-hmm. Men in Black neural. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but he has <laughs> it, he does it with dice. Yeah, he's he yahtsees it. Yeah, he does the yah he does yahtsee and then everyone forgets. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so then that it all made, I mean, it all made sense, but I just didn't realize what they were pulling from the actual movie or if they, you know, like CGI re retro, you know. No, all whatever. of that stuff seemed like clips from the second movie. There may have right. been like filler shots from behind where you can't see their younger faces, but like yeah. they, ab- the, most of that stuff was absolutely from the second movie. Fantastic. Well, yeah, I enjoyed uh, a lot of the, the setup for that um we'll talk about the 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 art teacher but i just want to say out loud that i think that she was very toxic for saying that you need Mm. to drudge up all of these things in order to create the best form of your art because i think that that can just be detrimental to your mental health even if you aren't dealing with astral projecting and demons trying to follow Mm. you i just think that that's not a good thing in general Um, yeah, the recall to the handprint on the sheets from the first movie, I thought mm. that that was great. Mm. The yeah. blood, blood handprint on the other bed in the <clears> room. <throat> um, I love that Tucker and Specs were back for that little YouTube clip um, <laughs> on astral projecting. And, uh, yeah, then we get to kind of the end and I was a little confused. Like Brian was saying it just, everything happened so quickly it was like nothing was happening and then everything happened especially when josh goes into the further or uh, like astral projects to try to check on dalton at first Mm -hmm. i was like well how did he know that dalton was also astral projecting or in the further in the first place but then i kind of put it together that when the brother was saying like there's something wrong with dalton that he was just trying to check on him but then Mm -hmm. they meet in the further and then try to I don't know. And then the whole door and the dad uh, and then Josh kind of saying, this ends with me and I'm just going to stay here and let him go. I just didn't buy it. I don't think that there was a big enough payoff because I thought that he was going to die. And then I was really going to be upset because I was like, this is not a great payoff for him to just die in this Mm -hmm. moment. I don't know. You tell me your thoughts about that. But um, it's very Game of Thrones. Hold the door. Mm. Hold the door. Hashtag hold the door. In a while. Yes. Hold the door, hold the door. Oh, Spoiler heart. alert for Game of Thrones for anyone <laughs> who hasn't seen it. Oops. Ah. Oops. Oops, sorry. Um, oopsie, yeah. oopsie. And I just didn't really like, uh, oopsie. Uh, <laughs> I still think that Josh is not a great, like, dad, even though you get Josh a, sucks. A, Thank you. Josh, okay. Josh sucks. And, and, and one of my gripes with this movie is it blames him sucking on the fact that he, like, it blames him as a bad parent on the fact that, like, his memory was wiped. And I'm like, yeah, well, I'll get into that dumb. in my gripes. That's horse shit. Okay, well, I'm glad that you agreed with that because I truly was like, what is it? I just feel like he's even worse. Like, literally in my notes, I was like, Josh seems even worse in this movie than yes. <laughs> in the first mm-hmm. one. Like, wh- mm-hmm. what is he doing? Um, yeah. But yeah, I put the end, my biggest gripe was the end seemed like a little rushed and not fleshed out. And um, I just think there were kind of holes in it. Like, maybe mm-hmm. if Dalton was kind of astral, finding his astral projecting thing a little sooner, then it could have all like fleshed out and connected a little bit better. It just seemed like he was only having visions of the demons. And then it's like, oh, now I know everything that's going on. Let me like try to fix the things. So mm. um but yes, Brian, you take it for, um, you know, take it on your likes and gripes for that whole section because it was not great for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. I let, let Jamie go first because I need to pull my okay, notes okay. up a little bit more. Yes, yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think I agree with like everything you said. I, I think that like direction wise, I think Patrick Wilson did a really good job. Like mm-hmm. for his directorial debut, like – I was into it and like I really in the moment of like separating like he's not responsible for, responsible for the screenplay like there's yes. definitely flaws in the screenplay mm-hmm. but I think he did the best with what he had and like I, I do think that he <clears throat> you know like I'm excited to see what what he does next um mm-hmm. I like that he just like came back to his spooky spooky roots I don't know to yeah. <laughs> to take this on his spooky um, Rudy's the spooky dookie rudies um i i also was like very impressed by the jump scares i 
screamed several times in the movie. The first one that got me was the the hand that came out of the picture jump scare. Yes, that was such a good um, one. That was a great one. I wrote that one down because I was like, oh, this is like, they're, th- I'm going to have a heart attack in this movie. Yeah. Um, and I, I also agree with what Brian had said of like, it felt like they were really building like so much tension around, you know, how are they both, how are both Dalton and Josh going to like rediscover that this is something that's a part of them and like Mm -hmm. somehow this doorway has been opened in like revisiting or unpacking the past trauma that they've like closed off and I also uh, I mean I'm still saying all the things I like uh you know all that's fine whatever I guess (laughs) the (laughs) the things that bothered me about this movie are um like it feeling rushed at the end, it feeling like they, I think I'm getting a little bit tired. This might be like a really hot take, so bear with me. Whoa. I, <laughs> I didn't even say it yet. Um, it depends on how it's executed. And this one, I don't think that they execute super well. But like in some in some movies, I'm kind of getting tired of like needing to use trauma as like the, the thing to to rally this whole movie around Mm. um like it first of all it's very heavy-handed especially at the end and Mm. i just i just like sometimes just want like a fun spooky scary movie and it kind of like takes it away when they're like oh well you know like dalton's got to work through his relationship with his dad and josh has to work through his relationship with not having a dad and then Mm. realizing that like his dad was institutionalized and, and you know what that means. Um, and then they have to like come back together and realize that they both have this traumatic experience that they both compartmentalize, but it's not healthy for either of them. And I'm just like, I just want the fun, scary movie back. Uh, mm. I don't always, I don't always need, and this is like coming from a therapist. I don't always <laughs> need it to be a metaphor for something. I'm just looking to have a fun time. So like, like it can I'm be spooky kind for of, spooky sake. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of just looking for spooky for spooky sake. Of yeah. course, there are still the move. There are still the Baba Dukes that like I'm still gonna love. Who? So maybe it's just. Sorry, there's still a uh, Senor Robert, Robert Duke. Duke. Yeah. Oh. Um, oh. Oh. Of course. <laughs> Uh, but I don't think that, like, I feel like now in this, like, contemporary horror, like, space that we're in, everything has to have some kind of deeper meaning. And there are some directors and writers who are able to execute that excellently. And, like, Mm -hmm. it's very effective and I love it. And then there are others that I feel like are jumping on the bandwagon because that's what's hot right now, but they don't execute it as well. And then that makes me annoyed that they even like try to give it some kind of deeper meaning to begin with. So I think that, and maybe, maybe that's like a silly like opinion to have because this movie has kind of always been about this family, but like, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just kind of over it. Like it just, it just wasn't executed well for me, so it kind of loses the meaning at this point, um, at least for for this particular chain. So, so that's kind of my like biggest gripe with it. And that was a hot take. Um, and some examples too. Uh, one of them is Dalton's line at the end, where uh, where his friend Chris is like, "Okay, you painted over the picture. Like, let's burn this fucker." And he's like, "Some mm-hmm. things we can't forget." Uh, tomato tomato i hated that i can't believe that they i cannot yeah everyone laughed i can't believe they left that in that movie like so unnecessary but then this is this was wild to me i don't know why it bothered me so much but as we do we brian and i typically sit through the credits of most movies that we see in theaters Ah! And then the song for the credits starts playing and it was like, stay with me or like, however, when I remember, but I know it was saying like, stay with me. And I was like, I was like, I, I in college watched uh, Phantom of the Opera several times. This sounds like Patrick Wilson singing this fucking song. And we sat through the whole 
credits to get to the song credits and he's fucking featured in this goddamn song so not only that i was like okay that's a little that's a little big ego for me but like the song was literally about them like staying together like we need to stay together and i was just like oh my god we we already fucking get it it was so cringy it was very Mm -hmm. weird i don't know why they did that i don't know why patrick wilson had to like be a part of that song like because that also i feel like goes back to i forget who said that first but like that josh sucks so like the idea that patrick wilson sang this stupid song at the end of this silly movie like (laughs) only annoyed me even more where it's like uh, like i'm walking away from this still affirmed in my belief that josh sucks and this Mm -hmm. song kind of makes josh suck even more even even though i know it's patrick wilson singing this song but like the idea that josh is like oh we overcame this and now we just gotta stay together because we're such a tight (laughs) family i i was i I literally screamed in the theater when i was like when i saw patrick wilson's name featured on that song yeah uh that was truly i don't know who thought that was a good idea i hope it wasn't patrick wilson Mm. But that that was not it. That like really, I was like, oh, I, I'm like decreasing several points in in my yeah. review just Literally, for that. The amount of throw up that happened with that ghost is like the amount of throw up I feel in my system from hearing that. That's wild. But yeah, we, so, we did stay, and there was like a mini after credit sequence where like with the light. Yeah, the mm, light turns mm-hmm. on above the door. So I guess like he didn't scare us away enough. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but, like, I don't know. There was something about the last, like, the third act where the writing kind of felt super sloppy. It was yes. it was those things. And then also, like, the little brother line. When Dalton's on the phone oh. with, with his brother. And he literally says something, something, little brother. And I was like, was that, like, an edit that they just, like, forgot to delete from the script that he says out loud? Like, nobody yeah. – I'm an only child, and I know that nobody talks like that. Like, how absurd. No, they don't. Yeah, it's like, tell me – tell yeah, because he, like, asks, siblings. like, what's going on? I, have, yeah, I, I, like, I don't say little sister. Like, no. Yeah, no, no that's weird. Yeah, it's super weird. It's very I hate weird. That. So, yeah. yeah, it's all just, like, little things. But, like – that being said, I know I'm being very, very picky. I still had a really good time. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, you know, I was happy to see the whole the whole family, including the forgotten child, <laughs> the little brother, and the little um, sister who gets sent sister. away. She's like, oh, she's at yeah. the sleepover. Oh, she goes. She's at the sleepover for forever. A week. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! But, Never um, to return. But yeah, I still I enjoyed it. I think out of one, two, and five, because I. I, I saw I've seen three and four, but I haven't seen them in a while, so I'm not going to include them in my thing. It's definitely like the lowest out of all of them, but it's not yeah. it's not like the worst of this universe or of of these types of movies that I've mm-hmm. ever seen. Yeah, absolutely, great, Brian. Stay uh, with me. <laughs> um, I feel similarly to Jamie in that I have a ton of gripes for this movie, but I still liked it. Like, like, yeah. you know, it's, it. I don't know if it's the nostalgia. I don't know if like it was just the tone or the jump scares, but, um, these are my likes. Chris Sinclair Daniel as Chris was my number one like for this. I think she mm-hmm. was wonderful. Um, the jump scares, like you said, were great. His direction was very good, especially with such a heavy handed script. He treated this a lot more seriously than James Wan did. Um, yes. in, like I, the only funny thing in this or like, campy or however you wanted to d- describe it silly was the vomiting uh which i loved mm. um but i didn't hate that he took it a little bit more seriously because it uh, because it is what it is i i, I didn't right. miss the other part of it um uh specs and tucker like you said but I, I mentioned this in my plot um i like that he was a kid who drew things and that was the opening credit sequence wasn't it um, like yeah, the, the, that was the, a great opening. Yeah, yeah. Um, with the drawings, I like that he actually became an artist. I think that was super mm-hmm. cool and very clever. Finally, um, but yeah, <laughs> I, I just had a really good time. I thought the jump scares, especially, were very good. Um, but uh, let's get into my gripes for this one. Um, I think the major problem with this movie is that three fourths of this movie is about two characters 
figuring out that they have powers that we have an audience member already know they have and have seen them use. That is not yes. interesting. And there weren't enough scares to justify that amount of time being taken up by that movie. Like, like I, I, I know that they are astral. I know they're like, what's wrong with me? I'm like, I know this is not interesting for me to find out, which is yeah. why in my personal opinion, they should have found out much early or it should be relentless jump scares and scares for three fourths of the movie. Like, yes, you, you have to one or the other, but they should have found out earlier. And also, as much as I didn't really dig that storyline, and I'm not sure if it's because I didn't really like it or because they didn't give it enough time to breathe, but they should have focused more on Josh finding out more about his father. Now that his mm. mother is dead, protecting him, like no longer his mom is no longer there as his guardian angel, if you will. And so mm -hmm. now his father can like attack him, be that like spirit on his shoulder. All of that stuff. We needed to do more investigation into that. And because that's the stuff we don't know. That's interesting. And even though we don't really like this, like, you can be genetically passed down trauma or the, but like, but you can be yeah. genetically passed down this power. And I think that's interesting. And I would have liked to learn more about that. And Dalton is like, oh man, I can astral project at college where he's trying to figure this out. And then you come to that scene where Renee's like, oh, I know this already. Um, mm -hmm. My other big gripe about this movie is they did Rose Burns Renee so dirty in this movie. They mm. blame her. The, the script explicitly blames her for the dissolution of their marriage, even though yep. from chapter one, he has been a bad husband and father. They're basically yeah, yes. saying that, like, well, if you if you if we hadn't erased our memories and you told me then we could have had an adult conversation about this, we could have worked through it. Yeah, mm. I think that is horseshit. Mm -hmm. I think and yeah. I think she defends herself really well because she was mm -hmm. basically like, listen, motherfucker you tried to kill us and i don't care the kids. i don't yes i don't i've been lying to them because i'm protecting your ass but like yes. you were the reason i didn't tell you is because i still wanted you to be some sort of a father and like so that you wouldn't get possessed by these things anymore like i, I just think that they do her so dirty and that really mm -hmm. i did not like that at all and then, and then, all, and then they don't even show the end of that conversation. The next thing we see is him in the further trying to save Dalton. I needed yeah. those ten minutes. I needed that ten minutes of her being like, "Listen, you're wrong, but I need to save our son. So fucking sit in that chair and like do your astral projection." Like I needed that. Yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. that really, I, I did not like that. I th and Renee's always been the 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 one that I like the most from the first two movies, and I thought yeah. they did her dirty in this one. Also, I really like the choice of them being divorced because like <laughs> she should have divorced him after the first one, but that's neither here nor there. Honestly, sure. um, but that was I mean I I think Brian and I had talked about that too after we watched the second one. We were like, oh, I wonder what the status of their relationship is going to be going into the third one because how the fuck do you come back from even though you know that your husband is possessed, how do you right. come back from seeing him? just looking like that towards you and your family. Like, I, I don't think that there's anything that, even if he did erase his memory, also like, exactly, like how lucky for him, how convenient for him to have to not remember the fact that he tried to murder his entire yeah. family. And she has to yeah. carry that every day and like lie to her children about that every day. Exactly, which to Brian's point is like, the fact that I'm glad that she did say like, even though me as an adult knew that it wasn't you, those kids didn't know the difference. No, yes. no regardless Absolutely of what's not. happening, I'm protecting my kids because yeah. they don't know the difference. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. whatever, we can't work through this with our kids having to deal with all that shit. Also, like, it's like, not going to work. And I had to remove the threat from the home. Even if you didn't remember, yeah. I had to remove the threat from the home. And yeah. this is where we are right now. Um, mm -hmm. Get it, Renee. Um, and yeah. then... <laughs> I, while I thought a lot of the scares were excellent, I thought a lot of them were repetitive. I mm. think that the um, that like that like ghost or whatever coming into focus behind him happens like twice, and the jump scares are very similar mm. in this movie. They all effective, but I needed a little bit more um, diversity in jump Variety. scare, if you will. Yeah. Mm. Um, mm. Um, something I didn't believe: Chris changing her tune when she was all in for his astral projecting. I know she was choked oh, by the yeah. ghost. 
I get it. She was choked by the ghost and he had to save her from the astral side or whatever it is. But then she's like, no, you stay away from me. It's like, listen, like. Don't even. I don't even want to talk about this anymore. Yeah, like, honestly, that did that felt out of character. That felt like a plot point um, as opposed yeah. to anything else. So that was something there. Um, the After an hour and a half of, like, the speeding thing, of building up to it, the end was just, like, so fast and quick with, like, the pictures yeah. and the tin and all of that. Also, I did not like that they took a picture together and there was nothing in the background. Like, when they took the picture... Yes. So, when they took mm. the picture, and he sent the picture <laughs> to his dad to say, like, I went to the party, it sucked. I thought the dad was going to see something in that picture. Same. That would That would have been a same, way same. more interesting turn. Yes. And then he finds the pictures of, like, him and his dad and stuff like that and sees those mm. pictures. That's more interesting, and that expedites that process. Yes. Yeah. Um, you should have wrote this movie. I know. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, um, <laughs> the dad describes the loss... Um, there was no payoff for Nick the dick. Oh yeah. In the bathroom. I, scene. Like what was the point? What like, was the point? Like I, I don't know. Hated yeah, it all. That was got, so awkward. Like I like when Chris kicked him in the groin. That was good. But if you're gonna bring him back being a total weirdo in the bathroom, like I needed some sort of a funny or weird payoff. Like all of a sudden, like Charlie was being hurt, and then he ran out of the like, I, and he was. I get that he was saying like, um, "Close the door, close the door," as all the other mm -hmm. ghosts were saying, and he was saying it too as like part of that. But like honestly, I needed a payoff. I needed a second payoff for Nick the Dick in that moment, not just like him being embarrassed that like the door's open while he's pooping. Like that. Yeah. that, that Thank was... you also for calling him by his full name every time. Nick the Dick. Nick the Dick. Mm -hmm. Um. But my one of my biggest gripes from this entire movie is how dare you have a needle drop and not like blast the tiptoe through the tulip song. They played the <laughs> intro and then once the once the chorus came on that like gets us all hyped for red and black monster demon, you know, who clearly lost RuPaul's drag race because he's not sewing anymore. <laughs> Like it's not, yeah. And that like, makeup is half painted on. Yeah, it's not all painted. But it, mm -hmm. but yeah, but in all seriousness, the fact that I didn't get like blasted in my ears with like tiptoe through the tulips was like an egregious mistake. Because here Absolutely. he is. We don't. We haven't seen this red demon since the first one. Because the second mm -hmm. one is really dealing with um, Patrick Wilson, the Josh's women. demons. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we and so I just we like we're back with red demon face. Like I was excited for that we also like that it's just like 15 minutes like i needed more with that like i needed more tiptoe through the tulips and that like i really let me let me say that again i needed more tiptoe through the tulips in that song in that moment with that volume like i, I just think that like i wanted that payoff this movie doesn't really do payoffs that well mm. no and just to your point brian i was just gonna say all of a sudden you just see Dalton chained back up again and I'm like how did we get here yeah I like you don't see yeah like th th that struggle yeah. with the demon he just is kind of like astral projecting and then being in different spots like he's figuring out like yeah, the memories are coming back to him and then all of a sudden he's like chained up again and I'm like wait what did I miss what happened because yeah. in the first one it's mostly from the parents perspective so when he goes into the coma and disappears into the further we just accept that like we understand how he's doing but if mm -hmm. we if if he astral projects and then chris is like hey dalton like are you there like trying to get him back you know and, and mm -hmm. when she's trying to protect his body in the dorm room which was actually a very cool sequence like yes then you need to give me everything else from patrick wilson's perspective because like mm -hmm. realistically this movie is about him redeeming himself in the eyes of his kids by dealing with his father i actually think we spent way too much time with dalton at college i think it should have been mm -hmm. even though i think josh is a duty head we should have spent more time with him because that's who this movie is about dalton should have been with the scares and the the thematic elements really should have been more with josh maybe he just had to be behind the camera more i don't know the script or whatever mm -hmm. but like but like and and so if we spent more time with josh in the end then we don't have to have that stuff with Dalton. He just knows where to find Dalton because he's been there before. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he knows exactly where the monster's keeping him. And, like, you know, we get a little bit of red and black face, um, you know, during the, the, the demon, during, like, the Chris sequence and stuff like that. And then, like, 
Yeah, and then, like, he wasn't sewing anymore. I'm really upset that he gave up sewing. Like, it seemed like he was very good at it. I hope that the RuPaul workroom, like, didn't, like, bust his confidence. But, like, R Black Red Demon, oh like, God. you know, I just wanted... I want him to find joy again. And, like, he got painted over and the door... Like, he just had a bad Which, day. Which, that was all weird. Like, what is that? A, a, a weird metaphor of, like, I, keeping your stuff contained? I don't know. I don't know, but I like that. I like that he painted the picture and the door. Because it, like, at least tied in with the rest of the movie. My issue was how mm. heavy-handed it all was before and after that. You know what I mean? Mm. I, I think the context of that took away from the actual, like, cleverness of, like, he's using the thing that makes him vulnerable, art, to not only figure that back out again but being able to control it and i think that's super cool yeah. but like they like literally took a giant mallet and was like sometimes you can't forget things <laughs> like <laughs> i don't know who that was yeah. that just came out <laughs> beautiful yeah i agree it's it just all was very very fast and heavy-handed yeah. but i liked it and it like, could have been good. yeah <laughs> I, yeah, I still liked it, which is like a weird like like thing. To, I don't know, but yeah. Well, it's just because like if the third if the third act was a different kind of outcome, then everything else doesn't seem so like oh this should have happened so that this can happen so this can happen. Like mm -hmm. it just the connection <clears throat> wasn't there. So the fact that the last chunk of it didn't set you up for success now it's i mean that's the end of the movie and then you're like well what the heck happened and then why did i deal with all the stuff in the first place but if the ending was better then it would have kind of like tied in together a little bit more for mm -hmm. us but yeah the jump scares though great patrick wilson oh it was good uh, something else i will like to say is i'm really happy that it won the box office this weekend and made a little bit of money um mm -hmm. any any time <laughs> a horror movie does well at the box office it gets me excited because then movie studios i know this is blumhouse and that's what they do but like it just yeah. gets me excited for like maybe we'll get another insidious movie maybe we will maybe like you know it beat indiana jones in its second weekend like i think that's like a really good sign for horror movies in general um, and mm -hmm. I know that had a lot to do with the reviews for a lot of these movies and stuff like that. But, like, that just gets me excited that, like, like we're, we're still on the upward path of horror movies doing well in movie theaters in this day and age. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Great. Well, Ooh. should we go into our next section, guys? Yes. Any, any other Indeed. thoughts? Okay, great. Fantastic. So let's get into our next part. Mmm, brains. <laughs> There mm. is a lot to discuss with this because just to say off top, the idea of Josh and his dad problems on top of like the demon problems being the thing that makes him a shitty person is just very annoying as we have already discussed. But to that, one of the quotes that I thought was really interesting is Dalton talking to his father and asking, you know, do you think you, did you ever think about getting some help with him being like foggy or just mm. being shitty in general? Yeah, yeah. And Patrick Wilson is like, nah, I'm gonna push through it. <laughs> and that just made me think like, can we talk about where the mentality comes from to just kind of like push through things and why it's so hard for people to try and ask for help because this, same issue that Josh has been having has been for years and he doesn't think at all to find some form of assistance or help. Like he's just okay sitting in how he is, how he operates when he's lost his family, you know, mm -hmm. like he's, he's divorced his wife. He has this terrible relationship with his kids and now his mom is dead. And I just feel like that's so much time that has passed for him to still be the same type of person. Mm -hmm. So my question is, it's just how, why can it be so hard for people to try to ask for help? And if you can just speak on in your experience, like people who have that mentality of like, yeah, I'm fine. I can do this by myself. It's all good. Also on yeah. top of that, he was taking, oh, no. he was, t oh no, on top of it, oh, help. Um, <laughs> on top of that, he just to add to the stress level that he was going through is like, it, it through context clues like it showed that he was taking care of his dying mother like mm, that yeah. adds to that like like all of that mm -hmm. yes yeah 
I mean, I think that it speaks to like the ongoing stigma around mental health and like that you can't mm. ask for help, that asking for help is viewed as a weakness and like, <clears throat> you know, like I, I, th- I literally think that that's it. I think that a lot mm. of folks struggle all the time with asking for help, even like in a variety of levels. So like some folks will seek out therapy, like talk therapy, but they don't feel comfortable with like medication management, which is mm, like yes. also a perfectly reasonable and like helpful way to manage, you know, symptoms of anxiety, depression, um, like bipolar, like all of these things. And there, but there's still so much resistance to exploring those as an option um, for again, like more mental health stigma and like the reasons that people come up with the idea of just like pushing through as if like, you know, all of these things are, are so simple when in fact, like they're so complicated, they have infiltrated every facet of your life. Like this isn't sustainable. Like it's okay to be able to like get support, get answers, um, you know, like deal with it in a different way than yes. how you have been. So yeah, I I was like a big eye roll to again once again, Josh mm-hmm. continues to be the duty daddy in this series and, and I'm Is that like <laughs> just like Is that like a sugar daddy. daddy, but like the opposite? Like, oh yeah. do you wanna be my duty daddy? <laughs> I hated that. I hate it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Duty. Yeah, I mean, he is a duty head, but yes. I have a question. Because he's been in three movies as a duty daddy, is he like, is he now <laughs> one of the like top like honorees in our Hall of Fame of like bad fathers in horror movies? I think so. I think I this think movie so. really solidified his spot. Is he, so he's the he's like king duty daddy. <laughs> oh my god. Sure. Yes. Uh, I I will take that. <laughs> Well, also, uh, another question just about King Duty Daddy uh, Head. I hate that um, this is a thing now. <laughs> it will be a thing I wish for the I rest never spoke. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, they try to kind of mull it over with the his dad had issues. So then it's connected to him and he's passed all that trauma down to josh as uh, someone who was an absent father on top of the actual like genetic like whatever schizophrenia things i think he was um institutionalized for and i want to talk about how people can break that kind of cycle who want to have healthy family relationships but don't have necessarily the tools or an example of a healthy relationship like how can um someone who be a good father or um, uh, yeah, just be a good father without having a father in their life, which is like possible, but Mm -hmm. when you don't have the tools or someone to like guide you, how can you um, kind of pick up those pieces? Yeah. I mean, I think that like, even without, excuse me, I think even without experiences, we Mm -hmm. can still like use other what I would say are transferable skills into other spaces. So like, Mm. even if we ourselves don't have certain familial relationships, because like we didn't grow up with a father, we didn't grow up with a mother or like we had more of a blended family or whatever it is. Like Mm -hmm. we, we also might still have like other relationships that we hold dearly that we've invested energy into, you know, those same skills can can be applied in other in other relationships that you can like take those things with you even though you yourself have not had it modeled for you um but like you know i think obviously that's like a a generalization because i i can't speak on not having like i I had both of my parents Mm -hmm. as my parents to raise me um but i think that like i also think it's important to remember that like the past isn't necessarily always going to repeat itself that like we we have control over ourselves and and our choices and our actions and like Mm -hmm. you know we can make decisions to be 
be the parent that like we always wanted to be. Like there are still, yes. there are still moments where it's like, I want to be a different parent from how my parents parented me. That was saying parents Absolutely. many times. Yes. But like there are things that like stand out in my childhood where it's like, well, I don't want to make my kid feel that. So like I'm going to do things differently. Mm-hmm. And I think yes. like, you know, we can even draw from other examples of things that like, we feel like didn't work for us as a way to be like, how do I, how do I do something else? How do I like be different? Um, so I, you know, those are other ways where like, even if we don't have the right example, so to speak, or like the example that we want to have experienced, I think that knowing that we can try to implement something different. So like just a reminder of what we have control over in our own actions and behaviors. So yeah, and I'm really uh, – no, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that somebody once said – I don't remember who it was or where I read it, but um, it's a quote that I remember quite often. It's that um, um, history doesn't repeat itself. People repeat history. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and to your point, I'm glad that also, Jamie, you mentioned not only people who – had absent parents but people who just want to change their parental styles from Mm. what they have already witnessed because Mm -hmm. like also (laughs) i myself growing up with two parents there are some things that i would do differently uh than than what they did and it is a matter of just kind of like controlling how you want to operate in that space as opposed Mm to kind of just saying oh yeah i'm shitty because my parents are shitty you know like it's we we have a better yeah, and it's not to say that those things aren't impacting us because they right. they yes. obviously do. But I think like if we just default to that, then it is kind of allowing that generational trauma to dictate like everything. And mm-hmm. like those things do like we are we are still carrying those things. So like that there I think has to be this like heightened level of awareness. If you are like already, you know, knowing that carrying that with you how does that also then impact like how you are moving forward? You you then are are like much more aware of like, oh, well, I didn't have like both of my parents to raise me. And, and mm-hmm. like that's something now that you have to carry with you if you decide to start a family. And like what does that mean for you? Um, do you do you like name that and bring that up? Like Dalton was aware and like named that and called his dad out for it by saying like, yes, you know, you can't blame the fact that your dad wasn't there for why you're a shitty dad, like always. Um, right. And <laughs> I mean, I think also for like the stories of the movies, like that was never addressed in the past ones ever. Um, mm-hmm. And his mom is like a not again, like, you know, she doesn't have to be like two people, but like she was a great mom. So you know, the fact that this suddenly becomes this like main thread is separately annoying. But I think like, yeah, having that awareness, I think any like knowledge is power. You use that, use like use that to be more intentional in the things that you're doing. But like, it doesn't erase the fact that that's your reality. It doesn't like fully take away. Like we can't undo or unlearn the the trauma that we've experienced or that's been passed down to us but we can Mm -hmm. still make choices moving forward and like that's what i think is is important to to keep in mind yeah absolutely that's great uh so (laughs) yes did it uh (laughs) wonderful so my last question is just about um grief counselors in general i think it's mentioned uh a little bit in this and it's just more of a generalized question, but of course there are therapists who specialize in, in certain things. So you have people who specialize in grief and working with people who are dealing with grief. But my general question is general question, general question. (laughs) What, to what point do you have to say to yourself, I should seek a grief counselor? Like, how much does the grief have to affect you and your day-to-day life in order for you to say, okay, something has to change and I need to specifically seek out a grief counselor? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I also feel like, you know, in terms of the threshold, like I don't think it needs to be very high. I think that, Mm. you know, this type of like life, I would say that like experiencing a loss is like a major life transition. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's like a unique, special life transition 
that, you know, might look differently from like moving or getting married, but it's still like this big, you know, life changing event that you're going to have to cope with. I think yes. that at at that point, like once it happens, like it's totally appropriate to start seeking grief counseling, um, even before you like kind of start experiencing other things. Um, but I think also kind of in what you're asking, like if it is impacting your relationships with others, if it's impacting mm-hmm. your ability to like, you know, do your your regular tasks, hobbies, um, if you lose interest in the things that you enjoy, if you're isolating yourself yeah. from others, um, you know, if it's impacting your ability to do your job, um, you know, if you're if it's impacting your sleeping habits, your your appetite, like all of those things. I think any any single one of those things, but certainly the collection of all of them is a very appropriate time to seek out grief counseling. Um, and like, you know, as we've talked about with like diagnoses and things like that, like there's no one, there's no like set time frame on like how long one is allowed to experience grief for, which is something mm-hmm. that comes up, you know, in, in some of the grief work that I've done in the past. I'm not explicitly a grief counselor, but like, again, life life happens. So like things are going to happen. Um, you know, there's no timeline in like, okay, by at the six month mark, you're going to be in the clear and you're never going to feel sad about this ever again. Like that's not, sorry, I'm sorry to break it to you all, but that is not a thing. Um, but like not only that, I think the real challenge is like how other people react to you dealing with your own grief often. Like people, Mm. like at least in the U S culturally, like people don't like talking about death. People do not like thinking about death. Like people Mm -hmm. do not like acknowledging death. It makes people very uncomfortable. And so I think that that also adds this pressure of like, get over it, get over it fast and let's move on because like people can't sit with it with you. So I feel like there's also, I mean, talking about stigma, there's also stigma around like, I need to push through this. Like I need to just get over it because it's so like difficult to sit with. Um, And I think a grief counselor can also really help with that because it's, it's not just about like processing your feelings, but it's also about like, how do I honor this person, you know, moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. That's wonderful. And I think that people really uh, feel like it has to be the extreme side in order Mm -hmm. to be like, okay, now I need help. But truly it is. There's a lot of times that people just feel like the emotions will go away. So they just try to hold out for that. And then they don't Mm -hmm. realize how much it just kind of seeps into other things because they're just trying to bypass everything else and just get, um, try to get the feeling to go away. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's what my therapist tells me all the time because I'm like, why do I have anxiety? Why can't this go away? And she's like, you just have to kind of hold its hand and walk with it mm-hmm. and have a different perspective on it because it's just going to be there. So yeah. it's all in, in how you um, look at it, how you take care of it as well, mm-hmm. as opposed to just trying to, like, shun it out of your life because mm-hmm. that's not reality. That's not yeah. how we operate and, like, as human beings. Yeah, the more you try to, like, push all of that shit away, the harder it is to actually, like, get through it. It's you're not, yes. it's not actually gone away. You've just put it in this little box, but, like, that box cannot be contained for long periods of time. It's going exactly. to spill out and open up, and it's going to feel even worse, and it's going to be more persistent and intense, mm-hmm. and it's going to be a lot harder to put it back in that box. What's in the box? And then box? you're going to have to call it Baba Duke and... <laughs> You both went two very different directions. Yeah, right. I love it. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, that's all that I have for the brains section. Um, Should we go on to Rotten Tomatoes? Well, before we do that, there's something Rot- I totally oh. didn't bring up. And, and it's it's oh. an absolute shame that we haven't talked about it yet. But um, Lynn Shay is in this film. <laughs> oh, Yeah. <laughs> Lin Shay is obviously uh, given the YouTube treatment, just like Specs and Tucker. But I also, a gripe of mine is, a like was that she was in it. A gripe was, it doesn't make any sense how she would appear to him at the end, in my opinion. Yes! No, yeah, didn't she already that. pass through? Yeah, I, I mean, she might be around, but like, I just hate, I, I, there are such better ways for, he should have ran into her in, uh, in, in there. 
I didn't like the ch- yeah, I, yes. the further as opposed yeah. to yeah, yeah. at the end out, the yeah. out in the world. Out. Totally. Yeah. Anyway, that really bothered me, but I was happy she was in the movie. So that was a likey gripey. Um, like. <laughs> Uh, oh wait, like we, we were going to talk about trauma and art. Yes. Oh yes, 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 yes. Okay. The with the immediately when the art teacher was saying, you know, your art has deep, to come deep. from this place. Yeah, this deep place inside of you, and immediately it's like he's pulling from all of his trauma that he doesn't even remember in this moment. Uh-huh. He's just like, okay, I'm just dredging up whatever decides to come to the forefront of my brain in this exercise. And that just really made my blood boil because in the arts, yes, is it is an expression of so many different emotions, right? But a lot of the times people tend to say like, your best art it comes from the worst, the deepest wounds that you have and in like acting classes and stuff when they're like yes here's a scene where you have to be emotional or you have to cry or whatever or be angry and the first thing that they say or a lot of these um scholars is not the word that i'm looking for but people like meisner and uta Hagen, you know their techniques mm-hmm. sometimes are like come from the deepest place within because that's the quote unquote going to be the most real authentic thing. Mm -hmm. And it's just very annoying because bringing up past trauma in all these situations, like how can you deal with that? How can you put that back inside? Like if you, especially if you've already processed it. Mm -hmm. So then it feels like you're keeping it in a box and then like having it spill out whenever you need it to, and then trying to contain it again, but it's only going to just keep kind of getting worse. So I don't know. Brian, how do you feel? I know that you were an actor and had to deal with that kind of stuff. Did you ever have moments where you're like, this is too much to try to think of something terrible that happened in my life just to get through Mm. a scene at an 8 8 a.m. acting two class? Yeah, I think, well, so this this is what I think. I think that acting is interesting because there are tons of theories and tons of, you know, um, uh, techniques to subscribe to. But in at the end of the day, you as an individual get to choose which techniques you want to use. And mm-hmm. while it's not, I some of them are not ideal for some people. And like at eight a.m. trying to cry because like you're trying to remember your grandma dying or whatever it is is like, oh, you know, like it's yes. not ideal. <laughs> but no. But at the end of the day, like I can go be in a play. And my, my, let's say I'm at a funeral in the play and I need to cry because I'm doing a eulogy. I don't necessarily, I mean, that's a very specific example, but like, I don't yes. have to necessarily pull from a death that I experienced in the past. I can pull, exactly. I can pull from like stubbing my toe once when I'm having an awful day and like, you know, but like, <laughs> but like, as long it's as the, the intention is there behind yeah. it, I also think that there's a very big difference between um, pulling trauma from in a scene with somebody else because if you are there in the scene what and with the other person that stuff should pull from it directly from like living that life as that character for a bit in that scene yeah exactly um, yes. we're also talking about stage acting whereas i it's very different when on the yes. camera because you're sitting around for hours so i get that you need to like hype yourself up but there are also physical ways to hype yourself up you know and 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 get yes. it out that way but going back to my previous example is like monologues are also different because you need to generate something from inside when doing a monologue. So that that's all but that's also that's also a very specific example again. Um but you know for me that never really worked um and I, you know you'd hope that a lot of these people who are actors are trained well enough that they can unlock that box and lock it back up again but they take the time mm. to decompress to put it back in yes. the box and things like that. But that is obviously not the case because we've seen how a lot of these things where they can't put it back in the box affect their personal lives on a very public level, whether it is a musician or whether it is an mm-hmm. actor or whether it is a, you know, an, a, 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 a fine artist in terms of like painting and stuff like that. Um, well, even like to your point, what Tom Holland, he had to take a break because the oh, last yeah. role that he played was so intense. And I'll speak to not Spider-Man, on... not Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> he had Zendaya with him. He was fine with it. But the other, I think this was like a TV show or something that he did. Yeah. The and... Apple, mm-hmm. the Apple plus one, I think it was. Yeah. The Apple TV mm-hmm. one. Uh-huh. 
And he had to take a break because it was so intense. Mm. And I will speak to Brian to your point about stage acting versus um, TV and film because for TV and film, like you only have to like make sure it happens one time to get the shot right. So like if something if you are drudging up whatever like Viola Davis is a perfect example of like she goes in on real experiences and she is like mm-hmm. snotting because of like her stuff and it <laughs> works for her but she also knows how to like compartmentalize and, and do that whatever mm-hmm. whatever then you have um what's her name from the last of us who was like I use a tear stick to make myself cry oh Bella Ramsey my yes thank you Bella Ramsey and the the tears that come out lead me to the emotion as opposed sure. to me finding an emotion inside of me to get that out. So mm. it is like pick pick your poison, but especially for stage acting, like for me, my husband cheats on me and my son dies at, for eight times a week. Yeah. So <laughs> me trying to think about something that's drop like an actual death in the family or like a breakup or whatever like that's not manageable no for you know what i mean but i can also Mm -hmm. imagine a world in which when you were in rehearsals you were using those things to generate that emotion and now every night it's muscle memory you know where you have to cry here Mm -hmm. and then the lyrics not the, the oh yeah the lyrics and the scenes are are generating that as well because you're also associating those things with those moments in general well and i will say this like it's not necessarily like in rehearsals me finding my own uh specific situation Uh but the just the feeling and the emotion of rejection and loss in general and then letting the text and everything else with it lead me forward as opposed to like and i guess guess i'm just thinking of like stop i hate when people think of a specific like my grandmother died and that's what i think about it's like you can think about how you felt when you lost Anything, well, yeah, because, you know? you know, I think an important thing that actors should be doing is like, you know, it's, it's you know, at one moment when you've lost, when you've lost something or when you're feeling like that you should take a second to remember what that feels like and then move on and let yourself allow you mm-hmm. feel those emotions. Yes. Um, but I also think we well, don't have to get into this here, but something you said, like, you know, the inside out versus outside in in terms of like how you get to those places and historically british actors are outside in and um Mm -hmm. american actors because of the newer techniques are inside out so you have like that makes sense yeah you have like brando and you know like 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 i mean uh what's his name from uh succession um Mm. jeremy strong like um Mm. like like being very much like um the what's what's the term uh method acting method? where like yes. you're in it all the time and you don't want to lose it so you're doing that like you know and and you know and, and then there's the you know that 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 meisner technique of like coming from the inside and out and stanislavski mm-hmm. you need to be doing something but pulling from other emotions and then you have yes. you have the british sense of thought where it's like there's a lot of physical acting in shakespeare where you have like the big gestures that like convey certain things so like it's and now they're all very much intertwined with each other but it's fascinating yeah for sure yeah it really is uh, and i guess the the thesis statement that i'm trying to say it's like if if you trying to act from the inside out is affecting your outside yes. life and mm-hmm. how you operate it's like that's a conversation that needs to be had and maybe we can try a different route mm-hmm. as opposed well, to you know um, trauma bleeding all over everything yeah. you know well, so uh, I, quick quick anecdote but Topher Grace when he was playing David Duke in Black Klansman um mm-hmm. every night he had a he ha- when he went home every night from filming he had tasks that he gave himself to decompress because it was affecting him so mm-hmm. much like i think what one thing he did was like he edited all of the hobbit movies into one movie like and like a, <laughs> like a concise better version of like all of that into one movie but like that yeah. was an action or a thing he can do that he'd know that was a positive thing that would like like help like separated him from this yeah character. The character. totally absolutely um <clears throat> and like robin williams used to call, they had just filmed hook 
and Robin Williams used to call Steven Spielberg after every day of filming Schindler's List to cheer him up mm. because he knew what he'd been mm. going through that day. Like, yeah. So, like, mm-hmm. there are ways that friends can help, that you can help if you're an actor or, a, or an yes. artist to, like, decompress from that. But, like, living it, it is just, like, unimaginable. Mm-mm. Unimaginable. I mean, it's already, like, life is already hard, yeah. right? And so for you to drudge up that kind of stuff, yeah. it's, yeah, it's well, like if I'm making fine, a fine couple, different outlets. If I'm making a couple million dollars on a movie, I'll live in it a little bit, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> anyway, let's, let's do Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, it'll, pay, it'll pay my bills for the therapy yeah, and yeah. all the other shit that I have yeah. to do because <laughs> of this. All right, let's do some Rotten Tomatoes. Yes, yes, yes. All right, what do you think Insidious the Red Door has on Rotten to Mom? It's the Rotten Tomatoes game. <laughs> rotten to Mom. Rotten to Mom. Oh, 72. Jamie? 61. Ooh, 35. No. <laughs> I think critics agree wow. with us. Woof. Wow. But the audience score is a 71%. Work. Wow. Yeah. So um, the critics' consensus is earlier installments had their, excuse me, earlier installing, oh my gosh, earlier installments <laughs> of red leather, yellow leather, you know, uh, <laughs> earlier installments have had their moments, but behind Insidious the Red Door lies the disappointing denouement of a once frightening franchise. Denouement? Yeah, fancy critic what a term. words. Um, yeah, I, I think I find <laughs> myself somewhere in between the 35 and 71. Yeah. Like, I agree. It's a big, I, it's a big I know, I know. But I agree with the sentiment of the 35, but I still had a good time in movie theaters for the 71. Mm. So it's bumped up a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, should we Fantastic. Should we do the four uh, S's? Yes. Skull, scare, shakes, and suggestions. The talking horror's four S's. <laughs> right. We have skulls, scares, Shakes and suggestions. Skulls is how we think this movie handled mental health and human behavior on a scale of 1 to 10. Scares is how scary was it on a 1 to 10. Shakes was how much will you remember this? Shake it off. Scale of 1 to 10. And then suggestions. What else should you watch? Uh, Jamie, let's start with you. Surely. Um, for Skulls, I gave this a 4 because I didn't really like the way that the people were peopling Josh is a doobie head. Oh, no. Uh, Duty daddy. King. Duty King daddy. Duty daddy. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, <laughs> and, I, yeah, I don't know. I just, like, there were so many, like, weird decisions that people were making that didn't really make any sense to me. Um, scares. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bump this up in my little thing. I'm going to give it a five. It really got me several times. Um, I thought so, you know, like, I can't, I can't deny all the times I screamed. Um, yeah. However, for Shakes, I'm going to give this a three. Um, it just, I think, is a pretty, uh, like, less impactful part of the chain and mm-hmm. will probably encourage folks to watch, like, the earlier ones as opposed to, to this one. Unless you're a completionist close, yeah. and you got to close out your trilogy. Sure. You got to close that door, baby. You got to close that door, baby. <laughs> uh, Nikisha, what are you giving this door? Uh, Jamie, our scores were almost the exact same. So Ooh. four and a five, skulls four, scares five, and then my shakes I put a two, so just one less oh, wow. than you. All the same reasons um, for me. Cool. So. Uh, skulls I gave it a five, scares I gave it a six, shakes I gave it a five because it closes out a trilogy. Like it's just gonna mm-hmm. now be associated with the first two, and so like I, mm-hmm. I gave it more almost out of obligation. Um, you know, is that makes you know what I mean? But I still had a fun yeah, yeah. time. Like, I also just like going to the movie theaters and seeing scary movies. So, like, you know, even if they're mm-hmm. not that great, if they give me a couple of scares and like the audience is into it, then like that 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 influences my opinion on that for sure. You you have to yeah. work harder as a horror movie when I'm watching it at home than you do when I'm watching it in the movie theater. That's mm-hmm. fair. The group experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, what suggestions do we have, friends? 
I just have one movie because I went the tortured artist route. Mm. So the new Candyman movie. Oh, that's a good one. Tortured artist. That is a good one. Jamie? I went went with uh, this family is being uh, (laughs) uh, tortured by this creepy demon creature. Um, So poltergeist. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go with the, um, I went more with like, um, sleeping and like things happening in your sleep. Ooh. Um, so I took a nap and I, I, I thought about it. <laughs> uh, I'm going with Mike Flanagan's before I wake. Ooh. Oh, nice. I thought you were going to say Mike Flanagan's doctor sleep. Oh, that's also an excellent one. Oh yeah. That's a good one too. I would say I, both of those have to do with like powers and sleeping and like connecting. So mm-hmm. I think either one of those um, is is super solid. Hmm. Grand. All right. Well, I think that wraps up our episode of Insidious: The Red Door. You can follow Ooh. us on the Instagram, on the TikTok on the Twitter, help us get to 20K on TikTok. That's our next goal. But also thank you for getting us to 15K. Also, we're on the threads now, baby. So follow us on there. Thread up, baby. (laughs) Thread it up. (laughs) And Brian, we're gonna show you there. (laughs) Yeah. Um, we're gonna listen to us brian yeah you can listen to us wherever you get your podcasts so like things like spotify apple Podcasts, rate and review us there five stars please and thank and you, thank you. wait should we play that patrick wilson song for the uh if i can find it stay patrick uh, yeah well, i also <laughs> don't want us fun. to get like a copyright strike Oh, true, oh, true. For vampire okay, last okay, week, cool, cool. I I almost got one, so I had to change it out. Uh, Maybe I'll I'll listen to it and then I I'll uh, I'll sing, sing it, it for yeah. you. Yeah, that's perfect. What is this? Wait, what are these words? <laughs> oh god, such How a crazy I... time. This is Ghost's cover of "Stay." Is this world? What is he saying? Man, Patrick Wilson, you really gotta enunciate a little bit more. He is All right, a when Tony did he get to the chorus? Uh, actor. <laughs> I did not. Sounds know like that. a Christmas song. Yeah, he started the Full Monty on Broadway. Oh, yeah. The more you know. Fantastic, Jamie. Are you finding Stay it? with me. Ooh, it's so breathy and ethereal. Because he's astral projecting the song. With me. All right, bye, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) Bye. Bye.